Finally, this is over, you son of a... Phone call? Hello? Is this Dugo? Is this Jeremy Irons? Yes, definitely. I've got a job for you. What is it? We need you to give a somewhat brief description of the film, The Beekeeper. Right now? Over the phone? Uh, no. I don't have time currently. Maybe make a presentation. I'll probably just listen to it in the background while I work, but I would still encourage you to incorporate silly video elements. That does sound like a job for me. Ha 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 ha! Ha 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 ha! Okay, bye! Oh, fiddlesticks and flapjacks. What was I gonna do with you? I'll just bring you with me. I'm sure I'll remember later. All right, let's watch this movie. You excited, pal? Hell yeah. We're introduced to Jason Statham's Adam Clay, AKA the beekeeper in an abandoned farm building where he's apprehending some naughty squatters for Mrs. Huxtable, who's in the kitchen cooking up a storm. With his mission complete, Adam meets with aforementioned Mrs. Huxtable, I mean, uh, Felicia Rashad's Eloise Parker, who's not so fond of the stinging little bastards. Those things scare me to death. Me too, adorable old lady, me too. Thankfully, Adam has things covered. What are you gonna do with him? Well, that's between me and them, if you don't mind. Is he gonna fuck these hornets? That's okay. I understand these things. Anyway, she calls him a blessing and he thanks her for taking care of him. So I guess since his retirement from whatever spooky clandestine nonsense he had to be a part of to facilitate this movie, he's been helping her with the upkeep of her farmland and she's been making him dinner? Whatever it is, it's clear she's softened this rugged old never mind. He's tasing the hornets to death with a paper bag, a broken fluorescent tube light, and a taser. Thinking quickly, Dave constructs a homemade megaphone using only some strings, a squirrel, and a megaphone. After Adam leaves to commit more beatrocities, Eloise settles in for a favorite pastime of senior citizens, balancing the old checkbook. Oh no, my hard drive is infected? Call immediately to avoid complete loss of data? Gee, I guess I better do that. Boss, got something, I got yeah? One. I got one. I want it. I need it. Hey, put it in my ear. Get this fucking hippie shit down, please. Ugh. You may not be able to trust him with your computer, but you can trust him to craft a nurturing aesthetic for men named Brayden. Anyway, Eloise downloads some definitely safe screen sharing software, and these guys take everything. Not just her retirement and her credit lines, but a $2 million charity account that she had full access to. She even almost prevented it, but all her kid photos, they're on the computer! So, with every dollar she's ever had so much as a conversation around gone, Eloise does the reasonable thing, what I'd expect a lot of people to do in this situation, and she- Adam, returning for the dinner he was promised, arrives to no dinner at all. Burner's still on, smoke alarm blaring, he grabs a knife. Just as he finds Eloise, her daughter, Verona, played by Emmy Raver Lampman, walks in and puts a gun to his head? And she's in the FBI? Eloise has a daughter in the FBI? Damn, that's crazy. Outside, Adam is all but cleared as the perp. Eloise's death is expected to be ruled a suicide, and we get to learn more about our titular hero. I keep bees. <laughs> I feel like I know him. After Adam is escorted away for fingerprinting, Verona ventures inside for some investigating, where she finds almost immediately that her poor sweet mother has been taken advantage of. Despite the emotional nature and difficulty with the situation, Verona finds Adam Clay and apologizes for her aggressive demeanor, and offers him a tasty beverage, which, while he declines, she does manage to drag some more information out of him. There's some British Isles hiding in your accent. I was born there. Verona tells Adam what she learned about the scamming and whatnot, and that the people who perpetrated and continue to perpetrate the scam are basically unknown and untouchable. Oh my god, what are we gonna do? I am panicking. Thankfully, Adam is here to deliver more bee-related metaphors. Someone hurts an older person. Sometimes I left to face the hornets alone. Which is what my grandpa used to do when I would panic. Listen here, kiddo. Life's like a bee wearing roller skates in a windstorm. Unpredictable and full of surprises. And remember, chasing dreams is like trying to catch a bee with a fishing net. It might seem impossible, but the thrill is in the chase. Oh, and never forget, bravery is facing a bee with a trumpet and asking it for a dance. 
Thank you, Papa. These ad ages still give me the courage I need today to poop in public restrooms. I need to take care of the hive. Oh yeah, time to kick some ass. Never mind. Boo! Oh, wait, that's a bomb. Hooray! Adam contacts his old contacts from that secret society, or should I say, secret society, which kind of just seems like the old timey phone switching ladies from John Wick, but with the mildest of tech upgrades. They succeed where the FBI failed. Well, we're not the FBI, are we? And find out where the scam calls have been scam coming from. United Data Group. Cue Adam Clay kicking the shit out of several people and then blowing up a public office building. That seems like a big explosion for two gas cans and some plastic explosive, but <laughs> what do I know? Hey, what's going on? Hey, is that Josh Hutcherson? I don't know why, but I really like that guy. Anyway, he plays Derek, who seems to run the grander scam operation. He's informed by his lackey of a disgruntled customer, but... You're telling me that this asshole burnt the entire building down and dropped four fucking bodies? Yeah, that's not exactly a disgruntled customer, is it? They did learn one important clue, though. Oh, he had a hat. Fortunately for Derek, he's connected to Jeremy Irons, who portrays Wallace, and he's the type of guy who can get things done. But despite being a former director of the CIA, a lot of spooky people in this movie. He has no interest. And you keep me a million miles away from your metaverse mess lab or whatever it is. Guess that uh, lacking lackey is gonna be handy handling this one himself. Agent Matt, Verona's partner, played by Bobby Nadiri, is dealing with some personal trouble of his own. But that's not gonna stop him from being the best FBI agent he can be. He calls Verona to give her the good news about the office building that scammed her mom out of over $2 million. It blew up! Matt gives her a suspect description of a jack dude in his 40s who manhandled security. <laughs> 40s? Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the lackey, uh, I guess he does have a name. Sorry, Mickey. Uh, lackey Mickey starts digging through his long list of victims, starting with Eloise. She's black, widow, just has a daughter in Boston. I don't think this is it. But... Which would normally uh, be the right assumption, but what was that you heard, Asian goon? You said your boy has an old ass pickup truck. Oh, right. That's him. Down the road, they find Adam's bee boxes. What the hell are those? Bee boxes. Yeah, Dick, I was talking about him. I guess he's a like bee lover. You're gonna pretend like you haven't heard of beekeepers? He keeps them. He doesn't make love to them, or does he? I understand these things. Anyway, they continue down the road and find the building Adam had leased from Eloise. Where you at, bee boy? You know, you guys can be as disrespectful as you would like, but we all saw you guys panic spray bullets into a bunch of machinery because you were startled by a shadow. They continue to attempt spray and pray tactics, but their sprays miss and their prayers go unanswered. Adam casually picks them off one by one to protect the hive. Damn, <laughs> that's crazy. And to make it worse, Adam taps a dangling goon's loafers and saunters away. You know, this is a really nice shirt, by the way. Did you steal it out of a casket, you dog fucker? Oh, man, that's a good one. I'm gonna keep that one. Oh, so you, you like fires? Yeah, today I do. Good, because apparently your mother's house is on fire too. Ooh, that's not a good one. Mm, but at least it was misleading. It looks like the only thing on fire is the building Adam was using. By the time Verona and Matt arrived, the police already on the scene have found a United Data Group badge connecting this fire to that <laughs> explosion. With Matt making the astute observation that maybe the jack dude in his 40s who blew up United Data Group is the same jack dude in his 40s who leased the building. Hmm. Derek is getting a temple massage and enjoying the therapeutic healing of Tibetan singing bowls when he is rudely interrupted by Lackey Mickey. The universe is gonna have to wait. Mickey tells Derek that several of his fingers have been removed. Fucking beekeeper. But at least he gives beekeepers the respect they deserve. Unfortunately, Adam is hearing none of it. Oh. He is done dealing with the dis spect Adam and Derek finally get to have a delightful little chat about getting Derek's affairs in order. I bet you don't have estate planning. I'm fucking 28 years old, why would I need that? I'm about to show you. Derek goes to Wallace again for help, seeing now that his situation is much more dire than he believed. He tells Wallace that all he knows is the man is a beekeeper, but being an ex-CIA director, he knows what beekeepers really are, which is, mm -hmm. You disturbed the beekeeper. But, but what do they do? If a beekeeper says you're gonna die, you're gonna die. Okay. Wallace exposits clearly that he is basically Derek's babysitter. As a favor to Derek's mother, who is... 
Mm, uh, we'll see. Uh, Derek again asks Wallace what a beekeeper is, and Wallace again just tells him, The guy who's gonna kill you. Thanks, Wallace. Very helpful. Verona and Matt discover that Adam Clay, the beekeeper, basically doesn't exist. He has a birth certificate and a social security number, but no bank accounts, credit cards, Facebook. He never even had a MySpace, right? Anyway, they then both run out of the station as the body of a naughty little boy, give or take four fingers, has been found. Let's go. We finally meet Derek's mother, played by Gemma Redgrave, who appears concerned, but Wallace quickly agrees to take care of the problem. Wonder why? Wallace calls the current CIA director, Janet, played by Minnie Driver, via the Central Intelligence Agency's Never Call This Line Line to request help with his beekeeper problem. Okay, so when you have a problem with bees, who do you call? A beekeeper. But when you have a problem with a beekeeper, where do you go from there? A keeper keeper? A beekeeper keeper? Current active beekeeper is aware of the issue. Oh, just a beekeeper. Okay, I'll remember that if I ever have a problem with bees. And then I also have a problem with the beekeeper I call to handle the bees. I hope they fight, like Pokemon trainers. I want a bee! Anyway, we learn Adam is a retired beekeeper and that the current beekeeper has been called to deal with him. Adam, moving on to his next target, stops to get some gas. As he admires a jar of his homemade honey, a woman with a terrible haircut smashes into his truck. <laughs> Women drivers, am I right? You've been a busy bee. Adam and the current beekeeper engage in a very exciting battle before he sets her ass on fire and leaves the scene, but not before cutting off one of her fingers. Oh, and then he steals this guy's truck, and as he leaves, the gas station explodes. Damn, that's crazy. Is that guy dead? Did he just steal some guy's truck and leave him to die? I need to take care of that. Okay. Shortly afterwards, CIA lady Janet calls Wallace and basically tells him to kick rocks. I'm sorry, Wallace. You're on your own. Woof. <laughs> Hate to be that guy. Matt and Verona arrive at what had previously been an unexploded gas station where they find a burned up dead woman who, like Adam, is a ghost. In the back of her truck, they find a beekeeping handbook called Beekeeping for Beekeepers. Also probably like Adam, he seems the type to hold on to a manual. Verona makes a guess based on the locational trajectory of recent explosions that Adam is headed to Boston, so she and Matt head that way as well. We find Wallace next speaking to a bunch of ex-special forces types in a mostly constructed building. Here, he explains to them, and us, finally, exactly what beekeepers are. Okay, basically, civilization is a hive, and people are all types of bees. But how do you fix the hive and the bees if the hive and or the bees are broken? So the hive, or the government, made a special role outside of the hive called beekeeper to keep the system working properly and protect the government hive and people bees, or as I like to call them, beeple, from corruption within the hive and the beeple, just like a normal beekeeper. So Wallace has gathered these men here today to tell them You are, in other words, pussies. And that they basically chug weenie compared to beekeepers, but that maybe, with enough of them, they can overpower him before he accomplishes his mission, which is to Kill his way to the top of the hive. This bee metaphor is really falling apart for me, but if I'm being honest, uh, that has no bearing at all on my enjoyment of this film so far. I'm having a great time. Verona has also had a great time reading the dead beekeepers beekeeping for beekeepers book. Some bees are queen slayers, which will rise up and kill their queen if she fails to produce the right kind of male offspring. Foreshadowing? But enough reading, because they just got a call that Deputy Director Prigg, played by Don Gillette, is about to arrive for a briefing. Oh, fuck! At the same time, Adam uses the burgle digit to break into the dead beekeeper's beekeeping bungalow to gear up for his next target. Verona and Matt brief the deputy director on what they've been doing, and while he's clearly fed up with the beekeeping nonsense, he basically agrees to give them whatever they want. <laughs> Score! I'm gonna get a PS5 for democracy. Dance music transition to a grease ball and a goat blazer who is in a nearly identical office to the one Adam just blew up in Springfield. The FBI arrive outside to secure the place, but private security under orders from the governor tell them, You're not welcome here. Get the fuck up. The hired goons try the same with racketeering Rico, but when money is on the line, you'll find that Rico can't be suaved. I don't think that makes sense, but you know what I mean. Head honcho Hinchgoon decides that this will be solved with a phone call to the boss man, but he has no idea how much of a cunt Derek is. Mr. Westwild works for me, which means that you work for me. I'm not gonna let some crash test dummy with a fucking gun fuck it up. Is that clear, Mr. Pettis? 
While this happens, Adam casually taunts the recently evicted FBI by telling them his exact plans to force the scammers out of the building. Because, as they have all surmised, there's only one entrance. If there was a back entrance, I would have used it. <laughs> Adam, you dog. Then, for funsies, Adam brutalizes every FBI agent within a 10-foot radius simultaneously, but he does politely only shoot them in their body armor. With the phone call finished up, Rico begins politely asking the hired security forces to leave. Bye bye, Admiral. Go join fucking Space Force. When Adam makes himself known by throwing an employee through the air, having apparently already made his way upstairs. He very graciously gives the swindlers one last chance to leave the building or die, but when Rico threatens to fire them, they calmly sit back down and continue their conversations with regular folk, like Nene Dolores in South Dakota, who is secretly the secret first wife of Sam Walton and has a computer filled to the brim with both viruses and Swiss bank account information worth billions. Lies aside, Adam runs through a flurry of bullets into the hallway where he first disables two men with ethernet cables, <laughs> nerd alert, and then he grabs the gun of Captain Dickhead, captain of the dickheads, and forces him to shoot the rest of the dickheads. Dickheads, no! Finally, he bonks the leader with a fire extinguisher and moves on. Kinda seems like he's getting off easy by comparison, but <laughs> I do love a good bong. Matt and Verona arrive outside and storm in just as Adam kills six men with an elevator, one of them being delegitated. As the FBI makes their way upstairs, Adam has already returned to Martin Shkreli's office for more information, which he gets by putting the office manager through one of the many unnecessary glass dividers in the office, then stapling his head repeatedly. Ow! Despite the tone of everything that just happened, we get a very strange moment of emotional sincerity from Adam. I don't know if he's trying to process the grief of losing one of the few people that has ever cared for him, or if he's trying to guilt the information out of Rico because he ran out of staples. But the information is divulged. Sometimes when the hive is out of balance, you have to replace the queen. Matt makes it to the pinnacle first and is rewarded with a polite ass kicking from Adam, who also gives him the bonus of dismantling his firearm before vanishing. Verona makes sure her partner is safe and they move into the office where Verona sees that a picture of Derek and Rico is set as a computer wallpaper. Matt expresses a shocked Holy shit. And we still have no idea why. At what appears to be the Gugino's restaurant from It's Always Sunny, Wallace takes Derek aside and informs him that the JSOC jackoffs have failed and that it's time to call Mummy for backup, surmising that if they were in her presence, surrounded by her people, they would be safe. But why? Are we finally gonna learn who the fuck she is? Madam President? Oh, fuck. Mmm, fuck, that makes sense. Okay. Verona and Matt meet with their deputy director again to give us some of the most clear-cut exposition we will get all movie. I guess at this point we're three quarters of the way through it, no point having any more secrets unless there's a major twist at the end. <gasps> Is President Jessica Danforth secretly possessed by the ghost of Ronald Reagan? No, but she did run the company her husband founded, the same company her son Derek now runs, Danforth Enterprises. We also learned that Danforth Enterprises has contracts with the intelligence community, where in particular one thing they provide is a software used to identify financial fraud. Huh? We'll come back to that. The rub here is that Derek's connection to the scam call centers and to Danforth Enterprises makes it appear that President Danforth's self-finance campaign was paid for using dirty money. Verona then moves on to the bee talk, all that beekeeping for beekeepers getting to her bee reign. She says that in a beehive, if a queen is producing defective offspring, a bee may become a queen slayer and kill the queen so that a new queen can generate non-defective, or I guess, uh, effective offspring. She then says, ignoring whether or not beekeepers are real, Adam admires bees and is likely to be intending to commit a hive coup of his own. Deputy Director Prigg gives them a blank check to get things taken care of. <laughs> yeah! Time to buy every PS5 game for my new PS5. The PlayStation 5 is for kids. Matt and Verona head to the president's villa where Wallace and Derek are bonding upstairs. Wallace is complaining about the Secret Service being mediocre, but I'm mostly distracted at how much Derek looks like a Cuban leprechaun, which probably shouldn't make sense, but I don't know, just look at him. Wallace demands that the Secret Service all move to the kitchen, I guess to minimize the amount of people Adam has to try to not kill, which doesn't make sense because wasn't the point of coming here to have a bunch of security? Who cares? Here we meet one of the coolest characters in the movie. It's really a shame that Taylor James Lazarus doesn't show up until the last leg of the movie. Pun intended, he's missing a leg. Because there's something that is just always more fun and cool about a guy with a heavy, uh, South African accent? Fuck, bro! Derek blames the situation they're all in on Wallace because <gasps> 
Derek was using a modified version of that financial fraud detection software to find and defraud easy targets, but bemoans that it didn't detect unfucking stoppable killing don't machines. Don't you fuck with me, young man. Wee. The final convergence begins as President Danforth arrives via helicopter and Adam arrives via sewer manhole in a series of movements where he hangs onto the bottom of vehicles, rolls on a skateboard between vehicles, and knocks an inquisitive Secret Service agent unconscious, steals his clothes, and stashes him into the vehicle's undercarriage. Damn. That's crazy. President Danforth catches her son hoofing Schneef off his dad's desk, yikes. Derek lies, but I think his dear old mummy sees through it. Oh, you're a good looking kid, you really are, you know that? What does that mean? It means that God doesn't give with both hands. As Lazarus greets a bunch of cocksuckers to the mansion with a hearty, Adam also arrives at the grounds and changes clothes again. His suit is so nice, the music swells. He slips into the party. Yeah, uh, Derek said he was gonna, you know, get together with some of my tech homies and stuff if that's, uh, that's cool with you. Anyway, he slips into the party as Verona and Matt watch their deputy director explain to President Danforth how fucked she is. She storms inside and saves this poor girl from what I'm sure was a fascinating and enlightening conversation about cryptocurrency and drags her son into a room with deputy director Prig. Prig and the Prez lay it all out about the dirty campaign funds, the call centers, and the fraud software. Out on the lawn, Verona, Matt, and Lazarus have finally caught up with Adam. They have him surrounded, on his knees, with guns drawn. And then the best part of the movie happens. Not even gonna set it up. Just, uh, just watch it. To be or not to be? Isn't that the bloody question? I think I'll take to be. <laughs> what the fuck? Anyway, Adam shoots a bunch of people, and then Adam scares a bunch of people, and then Adam stabs a bunch of people, and then we cut to President Danforth. Can I call you Jessica? Great. We cut to Jessica, berating her son. You broke the rules. You corrupted an imperfect but functioning system. At least someone seems to understand how beekeepers work. Jessica says that they didn't need the dirty money because they were well off enough, but Derek claims that she still would have lost without his help. Smashed between bits of this conversation are scenes of Adam brutalizing Secret Service agents and fatalizing goons of questionable origin. The most important information that comes from this is Derek confirming, I taught CIA software to hunt money. And, and not terrorists. You didn't hear that. And Jessica claiming to come clean. Having basically fucked everyone available up, Adam continues onwards into the first fight of this entire movie where someone actually seems to hurt him. That someone is, of course, Lazarus. After a bit of a comfortable back and forth, Adam dices Lazarus up like sashimi and leaves him with one final heartfelt bong of goodbye. Just ahead, Wallace confronts Adam, but not physically, more in a ghost of nation state future kind of way, but Adam sees through his bullshit. We wouldn't need beekeepers if it wasn't for men like you. That's right, get bent you two-bit whore. Just before Adam can breach Jessica's entry, Derek pulls a huge revolver out of a desk and blasts Deputy Director Prig in the chest, killing him instantly. Adam enters, Derek takes his mom hostage, and Verona and Matt barge in through another door. It's not too long, so uh, I'll just let this play out. I want this. Bye, Mom. <laughs> but then the movie just sort of ends. Adam puts on some diving gear and just swims away. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. Oh shit, I remember what I was gonna do with you now. You're not gonna kill me, are you? Kill you? <laughs> of course not. Pretty hard to milk a dead guy. <laughs> now, no! Hello? I just wanted to congratulate you on your work. Riveting stuff. Yeah, 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 but you only call when you have more work. Impeccable instincts as always. We'll be in touch soon. Oh, yes. I'll be touching you very soon. <laughs> Oh God, no, not again. No, help me, please, anybody. Steel in my veins, heart made of fire. Bullets and danger were my sole desire. A secret agent, the best of the best. I fought for my country, never took rest.
But the war took its toll Left me broken and tired Seeking solace in the calm that I desire I traded my guns for a beekeeper suit Found redemption in the 